Bibles this evening and uh, turn to uh, uh, some passages now. Now tonight is one of those lessons that uh, uh, give you from the Word of God, and this is one of those Bible lessons, more of a Bible lesson than, than preaching at you, but I'm going to preach at you a little bit too. And, uh, and uh, so you get a little bit of preaching at as well as a, a Bible lesson. Uh, but uh, tonight I'm going to preach on, turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's read one verse and then I'm going to preach the message. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's read verse 10. And if you've got a blank sheet here, this is a good place to put the message. And if you have a blank sheet in your Bible, uh, this is one of those messages you want to write down in, the, in somewhere in your Bible, because this is something that will last you for, uh, from now until you get home to heaven. It will give you great understanding of the world and great understanding of unsaved man's situation, and as well as great understanding as a Christian. And so you want to get this message down pat. It's a great doctrinal message. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's read verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must, this is a must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight I pray that you'll give me a, a clear mind. I pray that you just wash my mind in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ this evening. I pray that you would bathe this message in the blood of Christ. Lord, wash it in the blood. Wash my wicked heart in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray this evening that I would only say what would be pleasing in your sight, Father. And Lord, pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to work through me this evening, and it would be a message that would encourage your people and give them will, uh, wisdom, give them understanding, and give them a practical thing in their daily lives. And uh, Lord, and also help and even save the unsaved. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now tonight I'm going to preach a message called The Believer's Threefold Judgment. The believer's threefold judgment. And every saved man, every believer, has three basic times and three basic places that he's judged, and a judgment takes place. And it's, uh, it's in those basic things. And the first one is found in the book of John, the Gospel of John. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3, and here's the beginning of it. John chapter 3, and you might write down there, you might write this down. He's judged as a sinner, past tense. He's judged as a son, present tense. And he's judged as a servant, future tense. Past tense, as a sinner, present tense. As a son, future tense, as a servant. A, a, a sinner, a son, and a servant. Past, present, and future. And that judgment is uh, three basic ways that a Christian, three basic folds of a Christian. All right, uh, past tense, uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, <clears throat> and let's look at verse 18. John three eighteen. Now notice how this verse is connected. He that believeth on him is not condemned. If you're saved and you're born again, there's no eternal condemnation that comes on you. If you're a child of God and you're God's child and you're saved, there's no eternal condemnation that can reach you. Not eternal condemnation. But there is temporary condemnation. There's no eternal condemnation comes on the saved. Now notice, but, now he's going to go to the unsaved. But he that believeth not, that's an unsaved man, is condemned already. 
because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. He's condemned already. You know where he was condemned at? He was condemned at the cross of Calvary. So the judgment that is passed for a Christian is the judgment that took place on the cross of Calvary. You say, Brother Bemis, when did that take place? That took place at the time that you came to the Lord Jesus Christ and heard the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary. God judged you as far as heaven and hell was concerned at the cross of Calvary. That's why when a Christian dies, he automatically goes to heaven. Do you know something? That's why an unsaved man automatically goes to hell because he's already been judged. The judgment has already came. It's already been passed. He's condemned under the wrath of God. <coughs> and he dies and goes to hell. You say, you mean to tell me he doesn't go to the judgment? No, he goes to hell. You say, hell? Right then and there? Right then and there. Why? Because his judgment is already passed. You say, is there another judgment for him? Yes, there is. Yes, there is another judgment for him. But his judgment of heaven and hell is already taking place at the cross of Calvary. It's already taking place for every saved man. When you got saved, the question of heaven and hell was taken care of at the judgment of the cross of Calvary. And that is past tense, back there in the past. All right, when did it happen? It happened the minute that you came to the cross of Calvary. You say, Brother Bemis, I was 50 years old, and that's when the judgment was. God, when you come to that cross of Calvary by believing the gospel, God judged you and said, here's a man, his sins are taken care of at the cross of Calvary, hell is settled for him. The question of heaven and hell never comes up again from that point. That point. Now, I didn't say you could sin and get away with that. Don't you? I'm not through with my message yet. You wait until I finish my message before you start criticizing me. <laughs> now, brethren, uh, the, but the question of heaven and hell took place at the cross of Calvary. You know why a man goes to hell? Because he rejects the cross of Calvary. Because he rejects the cross of Calvary. Because that's the time of judgment. All right, again, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. And I showed you that they're condemned already. And that took place at the cross of Calvary. Not only are they condemned already, but God's wrath is upon them. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth, that's a saved man, it's you and me if you're saved. He that believeth on the Son of hath, present tense, right now, everlasting life. That's something I have right now. I have everlasting life. I'm not going to get it in the future. When somebody tries to tell you you're going to get uh, everlasting life in the future, they're teaching you heresy. Brother, you got it now or you're lost and going to hell. All right? And he that believeth not, that's an unsaved man, the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Not only has God judged him, and not only has God condemned him, but God's wrath is upon him. You say, man, that sounds like Calvinism. I don't care what it sounds like, it's the Bible. God's wrath is on him, and God's wrath abides on him, and he's already condemned. You say, why isn't he in hell? Because he's not dead. You say, can he get saved? Of course he can get saved. Of course you can get saved. But the judgment is already there. If he rejects the cross of Calvary, he can still find it maybe six months later. Or six weeks later. Or six years later. Some men reject the cross of Calvary and turn down Jesus Christ and turn him down five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. I've known men to turn down Jesus Christ a hundred times. Turn down the cross of Calvary. Now, when I come to the cross, brother, I didn't turn it down very many times. You know what more a lot of men will do? A lot of men, as soon as they find out the cross of Calvary and really see it, they'll say, that's it, and they don't turn it down. Some men don't turn it down. All right. Uh, again, uh, I want to say this. 
at the cross of Calvary that took place when you got saved and you come to the cross and you realize that Jesus Christ died on, on, on for your sins on the cross of Calvary and you heard about the gospel and heard that his death paid for your sins and you said, yes, I'll believe that, I'll accept that. At that moment, you got saved. But in that, there's some things involved. Number one, you had to deal with sin. Because at judgment, God deals with sin. At the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to deal with sin. At the great white throne judgment, he's going to deal with sin. At the judgment now as a son, he's going to deal with sin. And the judgment passed at the cross of Calvary, he dealt with sin. And in fact, if you did not let him deal with sin at the cross of Calvary, you didn't even get saved. There's no such thing as salvation without dealing with sin at the cross of Calvary. You know what we have nowadays? We have a whole bunch of folks that are trying to lead Jesus Christ as people to Jesus Christ without dealing with the sin matter. Amen. A lot of folks saying, Jesus come in. I'll give you an example. Some folks get out and they start witnessing and winning souls. And they say, now, honey, there's some little girl about 10 years old, you know. Say, now, honey, if you'll just ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your friend. Now, tell me something. What girl in the world would not ask Jesus Christ to come into the heart and be their friend? Pray tell me that. There's not a woman in the world who would not want Jesus Christ to be their friend. You know what the problem is? You didn't deal with sin. You say, explain it. All right. You come down in here. You stick that finger across the Pope and say, honey, you're a sinner. And then she said, oh, no, I'm not. You know why? She don't want to deal with that sin. She don't want to deal with that sin. Brother, and there's no such thing as the judgment of the cross of Calvary unless a saved man has dealt with a sin matter between him and God. Prove it to you. Why did Jesus Christ die? Why did he die? He died for our sins. He died for our sins. You pass that on by and you say he died for my sin, the sins of the world. Yes, he died for your sins. And when you say, I'm a sinner, one time I said to a fellow, you're a sinner. And he said, oh, preacher, don't say that. <laughs> and then after a while, after I got talking to him and explaining to him about her sinner, he said, oh, yes. Hey, hey, man, preacher, I'm a sinner. After he got to realizing that Jesus died for sinners, and if he wasn't a sinner, Jesus didn't die for him, he said, preacher, I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> See, once they realize that salvation and sin are tied together, brother, they have no problem with it then. But until you realize that sin and the cross of Calvary are together, then you fight against that sin and you won't get saved. I'll show it to you. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, and look at verse 19. In John chapter 3, verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come unto the world. Jesus Christ is the light. And, no man, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. You know why folks don't get saved? Because they're evil. Because they're evil. They're sinful. They're wicked. And they don't want to face that sin issue. Therefore, they don't get saved. You tell me a man that says, Preacher, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm no good. You know what I say about that man? I say he may be no good and he may be a sinner, but he's got enough good goodness in him to come to Jesus Christ. It said, it said they hated the light, and least their deeds should be reproved. That's what the verse just said. Said least their deeds should be reproved. You know what the man that loves the light? He said, My deeds are no good, they're sorry and worthless. I'm just gonna come to the light anyway. Now see, that's what the judgment took place at the cross of Calvary. That's past for me. And that is a matter of heaven. And hell. And it had to do with the Lord Jesus Christ and me. 
had nothing to do with the baptismal pool, had nothing to do with the communion table, had nothing to do with church membership. It was between me and Jesus Christ. It was between you and Jesus Christ. Now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your sin bearer, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your sin bearer, you don't know what I'm talking about. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, that's past tense. That's in the past. That happened to me in... <coughs> terrible, terrible. <laughs> Remember, they say the older you get, the more forgetful you are. I must be very old. I got it wrote down here. 1960 of uh, January. About January the 15th, 1960, I wrote down. You say about that time? About that time. You say, what are you saying, Brother Bemis? I'm saying God judged me at that time and my destination of heaven and hell was settled and it's over with and it'll never be brought up again at any time place in the future of eternity it was settled by who by the Lord Jesus Christ himself by taking my sins upon him on the cross of Calvary that's the judgment of a Christian in the past all right judgment number two judgment number two judgment number two is the judgment as a son not as a sinner but the judgment as a son that is present tense not the judgment as a sinner that's past tense but this is a judgment as a son now this judgment is a judgment that takes place right now in this life every day every day from one day to the next to the next to the next until you go home to heaven or tell the Lord raptures us out but that's God judging you as a son. You know something? The relationship is different between sin, between those that are his sons and those that are not his sons. Before God looked at an unsaved man and saw him sin, and he had a different attitude towards it. And then when God looks at his children's sin, he has a different attitude towards it. Don't you know that you're... Now, to prove it to you, all you ladies here this evening, aren't your children more precious than just children? Say amen. amen. Don't you give your children benefits that you don't give other children? Say amen. amen. Now, amen. I'll tell you something else. You love your children more than you love other children. You say, what is that? That's the way the Lord does it. That's the way the Lord does it. He, you know, some of you let your children get away with ten times more than you do the other kids. <laughs> your children can come in and your children can just, I, I, let, I let John and Joel just get away with some things that if I see some other kids do it, I say, what do they do that for? Why don't the parents just make their kids straight and nothing do right? <laughs> and then when my own boy does it, I think, mm, oh. <laughs> Stuck my foot in it then, you know. And that's the way you look at it. Because they're your children. I'll tell you something else. If you're here tonight, you're saved. You're God's child. And God looks different at you than he looks at an unsaved person. All right, now let me give you some verses of scripture. All right, num number one. Like, not like, like the lost person at the cross of Calvary dealt with sin to get saved. At that judgment, he had to deal with sin to get saved. Amen? Amen. Or he didn't get saved. Amen? <laughs> Amen. The Christian in the daily judgment of his life, he has got to deal with sin. He's not a matter of heaven and hell anymore, but it's a matter of fellowship. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, and this is the judgment now, uh, the believer's threefold judgment. This is the second judgment that takes place right now in a believer's life from day to day. All right. Uh, John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, and let's start reading verse 6. 
Now you need to get this clear because then you'll know the relationship of the unsaved man's sins and the Christian sins and you'll know the relationship why an unsaved man's going to hell and the Christian's not going to hell when he sins. Do they both sin? Amen. That's why Apostle Paul said I'm the chief of sinners. They both sin. Why don't they both go to hell then? Because one's relationship of sin is as a son and the other's relationship of sin is is as a sinner. That's the difference. All right, now let's read. First John chapter 1, verse 6. If, that's a qualification word, if, qualification, if you do this, if you don't do it. What if you don't? Well, we'll talk about what if you don't. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If a man says, I have fellowship with Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I just love the Bible. Oh, I love to pray. Oh, I just love Jesus so much. Me and Jesus, we're just like that. And then he goes out here and gets drunk and lives like the devil and all that kind of junk. You know what he's doing? He's lying. He's lying. He ain't having fellowship. He's lying. He's not only just lying to other people, but he's lying to himself. He's not only trying to deceive other people, but he's deceiving himself. It's said, if we say we have fellowship with him, and some folks will say they have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, they don't do what God wants them to do, we lie and do not the truth. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, that means to go by what the Bible says, and do the best the Bible says, and do what you can as far as the Bible says. If we walk in the light, that means to go with the Bible to the best of your ability. You're not going to fulfill it all, but to do what you can from the Bible. Try. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What if you don't walk in the light? What if you don't walk in the light? Fellow says, if you walk in the light, we have fellowship. I'll tell you something. If you don't walk in the light, you don't have fellowship. It's not a matter of heaven and hell. That was judged at the cross of Calvary when you got saved. It's no longer a judgment of heaven and hell anymore. Now it's a judgment of fellowship or no fellowship. You say, what is it to have fellowship with Jesus Christ? Ha. Ah, if you don't know that, brethren, you're out of fellowship. You're out of fellowship. Brother, if you don't know what it's like to have fellowship with Jesus, uh, either you're not saved or you or either you're not saved or you don't have a close walk with the Lord. You ain't got down on your hands and knees and said, Lord, I've sinned here, and Lord, I've sinned there, and Lord, forgive me and wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ, and may our fellowship be right. You say, What's fellowship? I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> Suppose that me and my wife have a knockdown drag out fight. And I just give her a piece of my mind. Yeah, I know. She's thinking you ain't got enough to give her out. <laughs> <laughs> and I come in and I say, what do we got for supper? She says, I didn't fix supper. And then I go on from, okay, I wasn't hungry anyway. And I go on and come in and I say, uh, you ready to go to town? She says, I've already went to town. I said, what? She said, well, you know, I went to town. I'm just supposed, no, it didn't happen. Let's just suppose. <laughs> and uh, I come along and three or four days, she just won't even talk to me. You know what's wrong? We're out of fellowship. Now, we've been out of fellowship before. And you've been out of fellowship with your wife before. Thank you. So you know what it is to be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and out of fellowship with him. I hope. Amen? Amen. 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 I, I think the illustration got home to you. All right, again, now notice that it said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in verse 9. If we confess our sins, what if you don't confess them? No, you're not. 
It said if. Is he talking to Christians? He sure is. I've heard people say that our sins are already forgiven. But that's as far as heaven and hell is concerned. That's past sins. I'm talking about fellowship now. If you don't confess those things, you ain't got no fellowship. Now, as far as that sin is concerned, as far as heaven and hell is concerned, that's never brought up again. That sin is gone. It's done over with. Those things are all up. When Jesus Christ died for your sins, were they all future? It was all future. Then does that mean you can just sin and do anything you want to do? No, you can't. It said, if we confess our sins, if you don't, brother, you will be out of fellowship. Not a matter of heaven and hell. That's taking place at cross Calvary. Past sins, when you accepted Christ, it's no longer heaven and hell. What is it? Fellowship. Now let me ask you, do you confess your sins daily? Now to prove to you, brother, or all of you, <laughs> that it's a saved man, look at verse 8 in front of it. If we, in verse 8, we, again, in verse 8, we, verse 8 again, us. All right, verse uh, 7, we, in verse 7, back to verse 6, if we, back to verse 5, we, brother, look back at verse 3, we, we, it's to the same people. He's not talking to an unsaved man. And in fact, an unsaved man confess his sins and go to hell. Amen. That's right. Go to hell. You say an unsaved man confesses his sins, you confess them every day to a priest and go to hell like a bullet. Why? Because that's not salvation. It's a matter of fellowship is what it is. Fellowship. All right, again, take your Bible. You want to get it clear now, brother? You want to get it laid down? You want to get it down path? You will not be in fellowship unless you deal with sin. Every day. You know what I do? I go to the Lord and I just, you know what God wants? God wants you to name him. Don't beat around the bush. When you come to get fellowship with God and you go to him and God and you want to stay in fellowship, you know what a lot of Christians do? They beat around the bush and say, Lord, forgive me for that fault I had yesterday. No, 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 brother. You name it. You call that by its name. A dirty, filthy, rotten lie. Amen. You say, Lord, I lied yesterday. I did the lie. Right then, I just lied. You sure you let me? I was lying. Don't you be around the bush around it. But you're not the fool of the Lord. So, no, 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 Lord knows you better than you know yourself. I mean, he wants it straight across the line, but it's just like it is. I mean, you say, that terrible sin? That one. You say, I wouldn't bring that before the throne of God. Yeah, but if you want cleanse, you better. If you want fellowship, you better. When that book said, if, brother, it meant if. And that's where you still have fellowship. Name him right on down the line. Put him under the blood of Jesus Christ, and then you get that fellowship right back like it ought to be. You know how to get back in fellowship with your wife? Put your arm around and kiss her, tell her you love her, tell her you're sorry. Amen? Amen. You know how you ladies get in fellowship with your husband again? You say, sorry, I'm sorry, dear. I'm dear, sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, dear. I was wrong. Amen? You do the Lord the same way. You get back in fellowship with the Lord the same way. You say, Lord, I'm wrong, and you deal with that sin matter. Just like the unsaved man's got to deal with that sin matter at the cross of coward. You get saved, and he doesn't say, deal with it, he don't get saved. Amen? Amen? The Christian has to deal with the sin matter day to day in his daily life, or he's out of fellowship. Again, again now, take your Bibles again. You know what Christians do? Christians cover up their sin. They hide it. Human nature in us. We hide it. We cover it up. Hide it up. So, no, they don't. Oh, yes, they do. 
Take your Bibles and turn to the greatest example of sin in the entire Bible and the first sin that originated in the earth, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3 it says... In verse 7, Genesis 3, 7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You know what Adam and Eve doing? They're hiding their sin. Hiding it. Covering it up. Just like some of you do. You hide it and you cover it up. You say, oh, Brother Venus, how do you know they was hiding, covering up their sin? Because of the verse in Job chapter 31, verse 33. Turn to it. Job chapter 31, verse 32, 33. Job 31, 33. And notice that God said that they covered, uh, Job, turn to it. Job chapter 31. And read verse 33. And it says, if I covered my transgression as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. If I covered my transgression, what? As Adam covered it. How did Adam cover it? He put on fig leaves. What's wrong? You know what? That's what people want to do. They want to cover it up. Cover it up. Cover it up. You know how you cover up sin? You say, oh, but Brother Bemis, this ain't sin. Are you know what they do? Christians, instead of covering up their sin, they pass the book on, book, pass the book and blame somebody else. They blame some other fellow for it. Oh, so and so. Oh, so and so and so and so and so and so. You know what Adam did? Adam come along. The Lord said, What do you do that for? You know what he said? He said, that woman you give me. <laughs> Did he? You know what he's doing? He's passing the buck with sin, just like a lot of folks do nowadays. Blame it on somebody else. Blame it on somebody else. I'll tell you something else they do. I say, don't cover your sin. Don't pass your sin on and blame somebody else for it. And don't excuse your sin. Excuse it. Oh, let me show you a verse. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs. I hope you've memorized this verse, and if you haven't memorized it, you ought to memorize it. Because in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, this is a terrible verse to some of God's people. This is one of those terrible verses in the Bible. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 28, and look at verse 13, and it says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesses, confesses, confesses his and forsakes them shall have mercy. What did it say? It said confess it. Have you confessed it? Have you confessed it? Have you confessed it? No it is. Have you confessed the sin? Have you forsaken it? Oh, you say, but Brother Bemis, the confess it. I'll go amen to that because that's First John chapter 9. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and grace us from all unrighteousness. And I know that verse. Amen? amen. Did the verse also say forsaken? That's the one you don't like. That forsaken apart. You just say, so something down on the inside, he just says, <laughs> You betcha. He said, why? Because I used to sit out there in the pew and I heard the preacher preach it at me. <laughs> I used to go, mm, I don't know about it. Forsake it. Forsake it. Forsake it. Just something about that forsaken it that gets you. Down on the inside. Forsake it. You know what that means? That means turn from it. That means S. S T T O P. I mean, stop it. 
Father. That means stop it. Or better yet, that means get busy. Maybe you're sin is something you ain't doing. Get busy and start doing it. All right, again, it is a matter of fellowship, and it's also a matter in this present time, it's a matter of God's judgment on you. It's a matter of God's judgment on you. You say, God's judgment on me? God's judgment on you. You say, prove it. Fine. First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Now I want you to believe in the word of God. First Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30 says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You know what that verse just said? That verse said, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged by who? By the Lord. And if you won't judge yourself, what the Lord's going to do? The Lord's going to judge you. Now, that's right now in this present life, as a son, present tense. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to condemn you. You'll say, but Brother Bemis, I'm saying that took place at the cause of Calvary. God is never going to judge you as far as heaven and hell is concerned. There's temporary condemnation. Did the, is the verse talking to a saved man? It says, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. There's temporary condemnation on a Christian. It's not eternal condemnation anymore. It's temporary. Temporary. Condemnation. I'll give, give it to you again. Romans chapter 8. Turn to the verse. Turn to the verse. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 1. Romans 8 and 1. Now this is the judgment as a son that is condemnation on the son, but it's temporary condemnation, not eternal. Now when you read through the Bible and you see the word condemnation, you better make sure that sometimes it is condemnation of an unsaved man or condemnation of the saved man, which is condemnation of the saved man. It's always temporary condemnation, never eternal. Never eternal. Eternal condemnation comes on only the unsaved. They got eternal condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Now watch it. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, comma. Now I, I stopped in the middle of the verse. Now you know what a lot of folks would quote you? They'd only quote you half the verse and say, see there's, there's no condemnation but those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God, go to hell, you no condemnation. But you didn't read the rest of the verse. Read the rest of the verse. What's the rest of the verse say? The rest of the verse says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What about those who walk after the flesh? What is that? There's condemnation. You say, prove it. You go out here and get drunk and walk after the flesh and live after the flesh. God's going to condemn you. It won't be eternal condemn condemnation, but it'll be condemnation. And God will judge you. Now, never make the mistake of thinking that all sickness and all trouble comes from sin. Don't ever think that. And a whole bunch of Christians do for some reason or another. Every time some Christian gets sick, they say, Oh, there's his sin coming home, and the chickens are coming home now. <laughs> and brother, you don't have it right. Every time something happens doesn't mean that that's because of sin. Doesn't mean not at all. Because Hebrews chapter 12, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 says, in Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 5, it says, for I have forgot, for ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son now despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, and chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Every Christian, no matter what his spiritual state is, he gets a whipping. You say, you say, Brother Venus has said, every son, every son, it don't make you can be right with God, be in fellowship with God, have every sin confessed up, and still be sick. And sin will have nothing to do with it whatsoever. You say sick? Absolutely. Why? Because every one of God's children get whipped. Because he loves them all. So he said, what son are his he who doesn't have no chastising? He's a what? He's a bastard and not a son. That's what God said. I'm a son. I'm his son. And brother, if I want to stay in fellowship with the Lord, I put those sins under. And put them under. Hey, no, here again. Don't let them pile up. Don't let them pile up. You know what Christians do? They let the sins pile up. You let them pile up, pile up, pile up, pile up, pile up. You know what you do? You'll hide one of your sins somewhere and forget where you hid it. <laughs> How's that one? <clears throat> I didn't forget where you. I hit a two hundred dollar check one time. And forgot where I hit it. <laughs> With two hundred smackers, and I hit it and didn't know where I hit it at. Well, I know it did find the thing. <laughs> you know some some of you'll do that with some of your sin if you don't keep up on it from day to day. It'll pile up on you and pile up on you and pile up on you, and you'll forget about it. You and I do. I say, Lord, remind me. Remind me and reveal it to me and show it to me. And then when he does, I, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ and say, put it under the blood, Lord, put it under the blood. Put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't put it under the blood, brother, you're going to face it. You're going to face it. As a Christian who sings and can live in the old way he wants to live and get away with it. You can't. You can't. You say, I won't go to hell. You won't go to hell, but you can't sin and get away with it. All right, again, again, take your Bibles, and this is the last part of the judgment, and that's a judgment as future. He's judged as a sinner past, he's judged as a son present, and he's judged as a servant future. Now, heaven and hell, that was determined at the cross of Calvary when you got saved down on your hands and knees somewhere. And that's taking place and all and over with. And your fellowship from day to day takes place in this life. That's as a son. Now, the future judgment in the future is when God is going to judge you as a servant. And it's not going to be a matter of heaven and hell because that's already over with. It's going to be God judging you as a servant. Now take your Bibles and turn to my text that I had this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn to it. Now you can't, you can't get this message tonight if you don't believe the Bible. If you're not a Bible believer, you ain't going to get it. And if you are a Bible believer, you can get it and you will get it if you believe the Bible. Alright, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9 says, If for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Good or bad. You know what? That word is bad, isn't it? Then you say, what is that? I'll tell you what it is. Fellow goes out here and he gets saved. And he gets born again. He becomes a child of God. And then he won't fight against sin. He just stays right with it. Is he saved because he received Jesus Christ? Can he sin and get away with it? You know where he faces it? He faces it over there. You say, but Brother Bemis, I've always believed that you don't face sin at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll face the results of it. You'll face the results of it. When Jesus Christ died for your sins in the cross of Calvary, 
Heaven and hell was taken care of. You never have to face heaven and hell again. But you have to face it from day to day in your personal life. And you'll have to face the results of it at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, how do I get out of it? Put it under the blood. <clears throat> Put it under the blood. And it'll be no results. God Almighty will come along and he'll look for sin. And it won't be none. Because it'll all be under the blood. All be under the blood. But if it ain't under the blood, brother, there's going to be some results. Oh, I'll show you again. All right. Take your Bibles. And you look at me with that idea saying, Preacher, I don't know if I believe that or not. <laughs> All right, now turn to the verse. First John, first John, first John, chapter two, and look at verse twenty eight. First John chapter two and look at verse twenty eight. First John chapter two and verse twenty eight says, And now little children, that say folks, abide in him. That when he shall appear, that second coming of Christ, that's when the judgment comes, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Ashamed. I'll tell you what to shame you. Not having your sins confessed up and put under the blood of Jesus Christ, you'll be ashamed. You'll be ashamed. Shameful. Oh, you say, oh, brother, being shameful, shameful. They're going to come a time that God Almighty is going to take and he's going to bring out every secret thing on earth that you've ever done. And if it ain't in the blood, you say, prove it to me. Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. First Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verse 5, which is the judgment seat of Christ, brother. Say, people. First Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. That's when the judgment seat of Christ is going to be. That's when it's going to take place at the rapture. Until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the heart. Then shall every man have praise of God. You know why it said every hidden thing of darkness? Because a lot of things take place that nobody knows about but God himself. It said hidden things of darkness. Hidden things. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You say, how does it work? They're going to come a time that God Almighty is going to bring you up there and he's going to say, what was your heart motive for this and what was your heart motive for that? And then God Almighty, over there it's going to be a matter of rewards or no rewards or shame. You want to lose rewards? Just keep on sinning. That's future. You want to lose fellowship? Just keep on sinning. If you want to lose salvation, don't face it at the cross of Calvary. But you've got to face sin. Face it then, heaven and hell is over with. Face it now, you stay in fellowship. Get it fast up and put it under the blood and you won't face it over there. But you had fight better face sin. And that's what we don't want to do. That's what we don't want to do. No, face that sin. Go on, chub it off. Chub it off. Hide it off. Hide it. Justify it. You know one of the best ways to justify sin? Get somebody else that's doing the sin that you're doing. Sure. Just say, well, Pastor Venus does it. Sure. Or Pastor so-and-so does it. Well, I know somebody, and she's a deacon's girl. Her daddy's a deacon. In the church, her daddy's a deacon. So it must be all right for me. Sure, that's the way to justify sin. Get somebody else that's doing the one you got. Brethren, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All eyes closed and all heads bowed. And Christians praying with me. Now Christian, I pray that you stay with me this evening. Now God dealt with your sin at the cross of Calvary and heaven and hell was settled. That sin matter as far as heaven and hell is concerned, that's over and that's done with. And that's under the blood of Christ and you never have a patient again. And when he died on the cross of Calvary, he took care of it. 
And I'll tell you something else. Every day in your daily life, you go back to the cross of Calvary. Because the Calvary takes care of that too. Calvary takes care of that too. You say, oh, Brother Bemis, Calvary, t it takes care of that too. But you've got to do your part, and that your part is you confess it. The unsaved man doesn't confess it. You do. Now I ask you this evening, is it under the blood of Christ? Do you do it from day to day? Every day. Every day. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he said, confess it and forsake it. Turn from it. Turn from it. You say, Brother Bemis, it's hard. You bet you it's hard. The Christian life is not easy. It's hard. It's hard. You say, Brother Bemis, you don't know what I got to go through. No, I don't, but God does. God does. And brother, he knows your flesh and bones, and he knows you're nothing but, but grass, and he knows you're made out of flesh. But he also wants you to do the best you can. And go at it one day at a time and one shot at a time. And put it down and put it under. Heavenly Father, I pray this evening. I'm not above it, Lord. I'm preaching to myself. Lord, the times that I've gotten out of fellowship, lost track of my sin of praying and my sin of witnessing, my sin of read, not reading the Bible. Lord, there's been many times that you and I have gotten out of fellowship in these matters. Lord, I pray that every Christian here tonight would understand what I'm preaching about, would apply it to their hearts and their souls and their lives. Lord, I pray that they would make it real to them, Father. And Lord, may they do it daily. Put it under the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And for his sake, amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Take your hymnal and turn the page. 331 in your hymnal. Page 331. 333 in your hymnal. Praise me, O God, and all my heart to Thee. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. And set me free. Heavenly Father, as I trust you with the results of the preaching of your word, Lord, I pray that your book has the power to change lives and change hearts. And Lord, I'm going to claim the power of the book tonight, Lord. And pray that it will change these people that are under the word of God. Seeing it has changed their lives already, Father. I pray that it continue to do just that, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Amen.